in September of 2006, the 18th installment of a racing franchise was released, and it acted as a sort of soft reboot for the series. And at the time, my 12-year-old brain had no idea of how important this game was going to become in my life. Because to this day, despite having so many favourite racing games, and so many favourite games in general, I would say without question, Test Drive Unlimited on any platform that I played it on, but especially the very first one being the PS2 in my case, is easily in my top five most formative games I have ever played. Now, Test Drive Unlimited is something of an oddity from a certain sense, because it's one of those games where, despite being very critically acclaimed at the time, averaging at least eight and a half scores across the board, pretty much, it's also a game which, especially by today's standards, seems to be something of a Marmite release. And for those who are unfamiliar with Marmite, it's very much a love it or hate it kind of food. Likewise, TDU just seems to be one of those games where people absolutely adore it, have loads of nostalgia about and still love it to this day, such as myself, or just don't care at all. <laughs> and there doesn't seem to be many people that are in between. In fact, I've heard a lot of people, which I can completely understand, because a lot of this does really rest on nostalgia and personal experience, who prefer, for example, the second game, which came out in 2011. Now, for me, I played the second game at length. I made some YouTube videos on it at the time, back in the potato cam days, and I certainly completed the vast majority, if not all, of the game. But it never had the same effect for me. The graphics were different, the physics were different, the vehicles just although newer in some cases and updated here and there, just didn't have the same kind of vibe. The music, the menus, just something about it, it, it didn't feel like it had the same soul to me. However, one of the things that I want to address in this video is this is about more than nostalgia. I believe there are actually certain quantifiable ways in which both the first and the second game, but for the purpose of this video, mostly the first one is what I'm going to be talking about, actually do have a provable, demonstrable spark, that lightning in a bottle, which many other games simply don't have. And I think you can look at specific points within the game to demonstrate this. Now, the first example I would give is the fact that this game did something which hardly any racing games do nowadays, and that is be a genuine rival release, wherein it was released on the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 2, the PC, of course with Windows, and even the PSP. They didn't care about console rivalries, they just wanted to sell copies. Gran Turismo isn't coming out on an Xbox anytime soon, Forza isn't coming out on a PlayStation, as much as we would love it. This game didn't care about that, but also, What's even stranger than that, because of course that's not unheard of, is the fact that each of those was so different. The PS2 version is nothing like the Xbox in so many ways. The PC version compared to the PSP. Now of course that would make sense on a hardware level, but I'm talking about more than just that. This isn't just the core graphics or physics engine. There are entire aspects of vehicle which are simply not included at all in certain versions of the game and are included in another. It's not a sequel versus the original, it's the same game just on a different console, and yet the experience is totally different. There are races, there are events, there are systems of earning points, etc. that are completely reworked for a different console. That's something which you really do not see that often. Usually multi-generation or multi-console releases, especially today, just take two prime examples of Gran Turismo 7 on the PS4, PS5, and of course Forza Horizon 5 on the current Xbox and the next gen. They make a concerted effort to make those cross-gen games feel as similar as possible, as far really as the, well, hardware will allow. Back then, they didn't care. They took entire vehicles, aspects of the game in and out and plugged it like it was just a Lego set. Now, that may seem unfair, and for certain people it could be. And I was certainly fortunate in that I had a PS2 version. Later on, I bought an Xbox and played that version. And even though I never had a PC that was good enough, I even bought the PC version just to say that I had it. And of course, I played it on the PSP as well. 
so I was fortunate to have the experience on multiple consoles, and I do kind of wish that I'd have had that PC experience, because from what I've seen at least and heard, the PC is by far the most versatile, with mods, graphics, physics, of course the, the famous Platinum mod with well over 800 vehicles, so the PC version is by far the best, I would say, even though I've never played it. From my experience, I went with the PS2 first, because that was simply the console that I played on at the time, then the Xbox, then the PSP. But the fact that each one was so different meant that I had zero qualms about playing through an entire game, which I'd already completed once or even twice, all over again. And this wasn't a case of playing through it now that you know the quick way through, or know a certain exploit that you can use to level up quickly, such as in like a Fallout or a Skyrim game. This is a case where the game at its core can sometimes be totally different to what you previously played, and yet you still love it again, with no advantage in experience. As strange as it sounds, and as unfair as some people may argue that is, and I couldn't necessarily disagree with you there, I will say that for me at least, I believe that is a core reason of why this game felt so different. I personally at least had never experienced a release like that that was so different in each of its iterations without even being a sequel. The second thing which I believe really sets this game apart, and again, to this day, there are vehicles, especially once you get into the Xbox DLC, not even including mods, wherein these vehicles just, they feel special. Every single car, every single motorcycle in any Test Drive Unlimited game feels like it's treated with so much love. And this is something which certain other franchises have done. Gran Turismo usually makes a very concerted effort to really make each car look really nice. And of course there are slip-ups here and there, such as carrying over Gran Turismo 4 graphics, etc. into later games, blah blah blah. But I think you know what I mean at its core. Cars are treated lovingly. Proportions, details, they really put in that extra effort and go the extra mile. Test Drive did that before this kind of era, and of course Gran Turismo was out at the time, but when you break out something like a Maserati in Test Drive Unlimited on the Xbox, an MC12 for example, my favourite Maserati of all, it just hits different. Sure, Forza had it at the time in the motorsport games, but it just didn't feel the same. It wasn't even close to the kind of love that just oozed out of Test Drive Unlimited. And as I said, with the DLC, for my young brain, which borderline exploded at the time with the sheer crazy vehicles that they were adding, cars which I'd never seen in other games before, and to this day sometimes never have again. The B-Engineering Adonis, the Cadillac 16 concept, to this day one of my favourite concept cars of all time, and here and there you'll see some of these in like a Project Gotham game or something like that, but generally they just blew my mind, <laughs> these DLC cars that were within the game, and some bikes too. MV Augustas, Ducatis, downloadable Kawasaki's Triumphs. I mean, again, to go back to Project Gotham, that was a game which experimented with cars and bikes being in the same platform, in the same game. But Project Gotham is a rabbit run, a hamster ball compared to Test Drive Unlimited's free roaming map. It's so enclosed that you feel like, or at least I felt, that I never get the full free reign of these awesome cars, whereas TDU with a thousand miles of road in Hawaii, let alone having a second map in the form of Ibiza in the second game, it was incredible. Again, this is 2006 we're talking about on a PlayStation 2 and even on a PSP. I mean, making Gran Turismo on the PSP was impressive. I believe Test Drive Unlimited on the PSP was even more impressive. Now, to go back to my point of treating these vehicles lovingly, to this day, there is not a single other game wherein me going into my garage and choosing a vehicle has felt as perfect as in that first TDU game. Regardless of console, but especially for me on the Xbox with the improved graphics and the extra cars and bikes to choose from. 
picking out something like an Adonis, even something familiar. You know, at the time I was already playing Gran Turismo 4, another hugely important game in my growing up, I had stuff like the Cadillac CN in there, there was the racing version of the Mercedes CLK LM, but again, they just hit different in TDU. You go into your garage and see this Cadillac CN and pop open the scissor doors. You sit inside it, start the engine in the garage. This was just stuff that you couldn't do in other games, at least not pure racing games. Maybe something like GTA, for example, at the time, but not a pure racing game. It just made every vehicle, like I said, feel like it was treated with so much love and so much respect. Sure, there were cars that were just completely OP, like your Koenigseggs and the iconic Salina 7 Twin Turbo, and even vehicles which have just fallen by the wayside, like the Chrysler ME412, which appeared in a number of games at the time and just hasn't really since. This, for me, looking back especially, but even at the time, even as a kid, in my early teens, I still, I think, had an inkling of this feeling like something a bit special. Something which was just almost unquantifiable or inquantifiable, whichever would be the correct term. <laughs> a game wherein everything just felt just right. The music, the menus, the, the music alone of Test Drive Unlimited has just a completely different tone to it. It's almost inappropriate for a kid. I mean, that's what I felt like at the time. I was like, what is this music? Because <laughs> it doesn't sound like racing music. I can imagine where I would hear this music and it's not in a racing game, but it gave a very interesting tone and atmosphere. It just felt classy. It felt suave. It felt euphoric. Almost like the way Gran Turismo 4 looked, from its menu to the cover of the box. It was just this heavenly gaming experience. Something which, again, most racing games don't even attempt to do, even some of the premium ones. Now, beyond this, I think the single thing which made me want to make this retrospective video the most is because I believe I have finally kind of solidified the single biggest reason why I believe TDU hits different to other more modern racing games, why it certainly hit different at the time, and why for me at least, and I believe for some of you as well, it has such a core place in our memory of growing up with racing games. And I believe it's actually something very simple, something so simple that you could easily miss it, something which probably won't be happening again anytime soon, especially now, and here's my main point, now that Drive Club 2 is never going to probably happen, because Drive Club did this exact same thing, and it did it so well. And in effect, Drive Club actually acts as evidence to support my theory. Because here it is. Look at games like Gran Turismo and Forza. Forza, in my opinion, is probably the ultimate example of this, but interestingly, you can even look back to games like Need for Speed and Midnight Club, Dub Edition, for example, Midnight Club LA. If you give someone a game that allows them to customize and modify and personalize a car in these crazy ways, and again, I said Forza was the prime example because all-wheel drive swaps, rear-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, engine swaps, crazy power, all of these insane over-the-top things that you can do to cars, which are not necessarily unrealistic in some cases, but in a separate video I talked about the fact that in my opinion at least, certain games, especially in the Horizon series, push swaps, engines, drivetrains, to such a degree that if you can essentially do that to any car, well then less and less cars actually feel special at that point. It starts to just become like an interchangeable body shell on the same vehicle underneath. So nothing really feels as special. In a game like Test Drive Unlimited, technically we could upgrade the cars, but the upgrade system was extremely primitive, very arcade-esque. It was just a level one, two, three kind of thing. You paid a certain amount of credits, and the car just magically got quicker. <laughs> you had a slight drop in weight, a slight increase in power and torque, your acceleration got a bit better, and so did your top speed. And that was pretty much it, except for a, a few specific vehicles, which became almost like secret cars. 
If I recall correctly, you could, for example, take a Mercedes SLK into the upgrade shop and turn it into a Black Series. You could take, I think it was the Nissan 350Z and turn it into a Nismo version, multiple Nismo versions in fact. And one of my favourites of all, you could take a boring Mustang GT in and turn it into a Celine. These things are not seen that often. In fact, think about the last time you saw something like that implemented to that level. When was it? Well, if you're anything like me, the first thing that comes to mind is Gran Turismo 2 with the race modifiers that many of us look back on with so much love, because it was such an unexpected aspect of the game. And it almost, and this is the crazy thing, it almost seems crazier now than it would have at the time. At the time it was really cool, but who'd have thought that a couple of decades later, that kind of implementation would be next to unseen in a racing game. When's the last time you played a racing game and you could take in a vehicle and turn it into another vehicle, legitimately another model, through tuning? Swapping an engine in Forza doesn't give you that kind of feeling, that feeling of uncovering something that you weren't supposed to find. I only had a Mustang, but now I've got a Celine. This is awesome. Now, that may be a little sad, that might come across as kind of pathetic, me putting it that way, but I can't be the only person who has that kind of feeling. But what am I talking about? What has this got to do with how the game felt special? Am I just talking about tuning? Well, actually, no. See, here's where Drive Club comes in. I'm not talking about tuning making Test Drive Unlimited so good, and, and the tuning system making the cars feel amazing, and by extension the game play feel amazing. It's actually quite the opposite. See, the reason why I believe TDU above all else does it so well in terms of representing and enjoying cars is because of the lack of tuning. By not going crazy, by not having the same level of personalization, it actually forces you, even though you don't realize it's doing it, it forces you to appreciate each individual vehicle in the game, be it car or bike, on its own merit alone you still have cars which are unquestionably the best in their category. Lower classes, stuff like Nobles, Skylines, higher classes, Koenigseggs, Selina 7s. For the bikes, a similar thing happens. There are OP vehicles, there are the obvious choices, but still, so many alternatives exist which are just as viable for winning events, not just online against real people, but also against the AI in a myriad of events, which, interestingly, have such a, in my opinion at least, excellent use of the map in order to provide races that are technically grindy to earn cash, but somehow manage to not quite feel that boring. Either the race is boring but pays really well, or it maybe doesn't pay as well, but it's a more interesting event. Something like, for example, the, the drag race, or equivalent to a drag race, on that famous stretch of road in Hawaii next to the water in the middle of the city, where we all used to congregate in online races for doing drag rolls. On the other hand, you had the massive millionaires race to end the game, going around the whole map. I believe it was something like a 48 mile event, which used to take like 40 minutes or something to do. In fact, I think it was a lot longer than 48 miles. I think it might have even been 100 or something crazy like that. But you'd get a million credits for it every time. I used to run a Koenigsegg up to stupid speeds and it never felt grindy. Even as a kid with a shorter attention span than I have now, it didn't feel like a grind. And when you buy the vehicles in these games, and again, this kind of mirrors onto Gran Turismo 7's current situation, at least at the time of releasing this video, with throttling, you know, the amount of money you can earn in events, and how difficult it is to attain what I would call high rollers cars for millions and millions of credits, in TDU there were cars that were really expensive. But it didn't feel like a grind. And something about how that game managed to capture these vehicles, the graphics, the sound, the performance, the vibe, it just made it feel that much more special when you actually did attain one. And I think part of it is because I would say that of all the racing games that I've played, TDU is actually the closest, or at least one of the closest, to being more of a driving game than it is a racing game. And the clue is kind of in the title. It's Test Drive Unlimited, not Race 
World Unlimited or something stupid like that. Now, of course, they didn't necessarily intentionally have the name and, and that kind of gameplay linked together, but I believe it is a happy turn of chance that it did. And for me, it's one of the things, one of the core reasons, really, why the sequel didn't live up to it for me. Because the sequel is much more conventional. It's all about the racing, and it's all about having the latest and greatest cars rather than cars which are less expected, more obscure, and have more charm. Sure, you've got your Nissan GTRs, you've got your Veyrons, all the obvious stuff. The first game didn't have any obvious stuff. Koenigseggs weren't obvious in 2006. Random Maserati, you know, uh, Cambio Corsa Spiders weren't obvious. Certainly half of the DLC wasn't obvious in the form of Cadillac concept cars, Viesmans, Adonises. They went out of their way to have the weirdest stuff in there. And it felt awesome because of it. Plus, they had a few of the well-known names like Vipers, Corvettes, Audi TTs, Mercedes CLKs, just to satiate everyone and make everyone feel included. It's not to say that the sequel didn't have any good ideas. I think adding SUVs and trucks was cool, adding off-road racing was a nice idea, and of course a second map is always welcome. But looking back, those such as myself who played the second game going into it after the first one, do you recall, because I certainly do, kind of just wanting to get Ibiza over and done with so that we could get back to Hawaii. <laughs> I can't be the only one who felt that way. And that's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why, if not the biggest reason, why TDU Solar Crown concerns me. I'm excited for it, but again, it's in the title. It's named after the championship. That's not why I love the first game. The racing almost feels incidental in Test Drive Unlimited. It's just a means to an end. Whereas in number two, it's more about the racing, the solar crown. And now the third game literally has it in the title. It's not bad to enjoy racing, but I already have games like that. I've already got Forza, I've already got Gran Turismo. Games which, let's be honest, do a much better job of professional tier racing than Test Drive ever will. So don't try and compete on those terms. For me, that is possibly the core of all cores, especially in combination with the fact that cars have less opportunity for tuning, meaning that each one feels more unique. And when you combine those things together with, of course, the addition of each console release being that much different, having one of the best free roaming maps ever included in the game, the fact that at the time nobody else was even attempting to have a map and a free roaming world like that in a racing game, and then the pepper sprinkled on the top was, of course, the fact that, as I mentioned, each console release was different to the other one. Not just a reskin, but an actual different game within the same world, but a very different vibe. Overall, though, that's it for my retrospective on Test Drive Unlimited. It's certainly a video and a game which you can easily tell I could talk about for a lot longer, but in the sake and in the service, of keeping it to a video that you'd actually want to watch all the way through, I'm going to leave it there. Ultimately, that's it for my thoughts on Test Drive Unlimited, and as you can kind of tell, I love this game. <laughs> so for those of you who are like me and did grow up with it, maybe some which are a little bit younger and went back to play it, or maybe even some who have never played it, Give me your thoughts down below. Do you disagree? Do you agree? Do you think there are additional things that made the game so good, which I maybe didn't mention? But ultimately, tell me if you would like to see more videos like this in the kind of retrospective essay format. I do have a couple of games in mind, which I might do this for if you would like to see them, such as Driver San Francisco, Gran Turismo 4, Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition, and maybe one or two others. But ultimately, until next time, I'll see you then, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.